Dutch painter who traveled to Rome to learn from artists like Michelangelo, and at 6.50 we take a city break to explore Florence in Italy. First, can biologists believe what they see through the microscope? There are eight million people in this city. And in each and every one of them, there are eight million times that number of living cells. Around 60 million million cells in the human body. So it might seem a bit strange to compare something as small as a cell with something as large as a city. But in fact, it's not quite as perverse as you might think. Stroll around any city and there's certain things you'd expect to see. Buildings where people live or ones where they work and produce goods, a power station to produce electricity, markets where people shop, roads, railways, bridges, perhaps even a river, all part of a complex transportation network to carry goods and people round the city. Now on a quite different scale, a cell also has a number of structures with particular functions. For example, chloroplasts, a plant cell's solar panels, or the nucleus, where genetic information is stored, a sort of cellular library or town planning office. Like all analogies, this one between cell and city must be treated with caution. We mustn't read too much into it. But it can be very useful. Just imagine you were a Martian in outer space, looking at a city on the surface of the Earth, and trying to find out what this object actually was and what, if anything, it, a city, did. How would you set about this? Well, arguably, if you're an intelligent Martian, the first thing you might try and do is build up a picture of the structure in as much detail as possible. Work out the different components of the structure, in other words, the city, and what the relationship is between these various components, how they sit vis-a-vis -vis each other. And having done that, you might try and find some sign of activity visually, sound, smell, whatever senses a Martian has. And then try and tie together these signs of activity with the various structures in the city. Now, in some senses, where cells are concerned, we're just like a Martian. OK, we haven't just arrived. We've been looking at cells for at least 100 years. But the basic approach is much the same as that that we recommend for the intelligent Martian. And what we hope to do in these six programs is to try and find out as much as possible about the detailed structure of cells, what cells contain. And then try to tie together these structures with activities that we know that cells as a whole perform. We'll look at the variety of techniques designed to do just that. Fine so far, but where do we begin? Well, we can't literally stroll around the cell, as we might around a city, because scale is against us. But what we can do is use our eyes, and in this case, extend our vision with the use of microscopes. There's a whole variety of types of microscopy giving you a variety of images. But ironically, to see detailed structures within cells, we often have to kill them first. When we do this, we fix them to stop them degrading. A tissue, as it comes out of an organism, is too thick often for light to shine through. So thin sections are necessary. To be able to cut very thin slices, you have to support what you're cutting. So they are normally embedded in wax.
The structures inside cells are transparent and colourless, so you need to differentially stain cells to bring up contrast to distinguish one from the other. We can demonstrate some typical techniques in preparing specimens for light microscopy. This kidney has been removed from a rat and rapidly fixed in 10% formalin. To embed it in wax, we must first remove the water from the tissue by passing it through an ascending series of alcohols. Finally, into a wax solvent, xylene. The kidneys then put into molten wax. This is put into an oven to keep the wax molten. The air is then removed from the oven because left under vacuum, the molten wax more easily infiltrates the tissues within the body of the kidney. After a few hours, the sample is removed and put into a mould which is further filled with molten wax. The wax is left to set. The block is tipped out of the mould and sealed onto a wooden block just like fixing a candle in a holder. The block can be trimmed first and then placed in a device called a microtome which amounts to a very fine bacon slicer allowing thin slices of kidney and wax to be shaved off as a ribbon. To get these onto a microscope slide, the fine slices are floated on the surface of water and the microscope slide is placed underneath to pick up a slice. By putting the whole thing on a hot plate, the wax can be melted away, leaving the fine section of kidney attached to the slide and ready for staining. The slide and specimen is once again taken through a series of alcohols. This done, the slide and specimen is placed in the first of the stains, hematoxylin. It's then put into tap water, removing any surplus stain. It's then put in the second stain, eosin. A thin square of glass, called a cover slip, is placed over the specimen, together with an adhesive to keep the specimen in place. Everything's now ready to examine the specimen. The slide is placed on the stage of the microscope. A suitable field of view and magnification are selected. By this double staining technique, the hematoxylin picks out the nuclei in blue, whereas the eosin stains the cytoplasm pink. That's how you can get an image, but how can you interpret what you're seeing? You're out in space and you're rapidly approaching Earth and your instruments are trained on a city and you're just picking up an object you've never seen before. Nothing like it on Mars. In fact, it's a house. But you don't know that. Are you sure you're in focus? OK, now focus your attention on just the object you're interested in. So ignore, or better still get rid of, all extraneous junk. But what is extraneous? <laughs> 
Say you see this. If you've never seen a house, then you've never seen a car. So where does the house end and the car begin? And is this a house? Or this? Are they different views of the same house? Two different houses? Or quite fundamentally different objects? And what about this? And is this a house or part of one? Can you in fact reconstruct a three-dimensional picture in your mind without actually having walked round the object? And do Martian telescopes, or Martian eyes for that matter, see in the human visible range, or in the X-ray or ultraviolet range? And what would things look like then? Perhaps you have to spray the object, to stain it, to bring it into the Martian visible range. And by this time, are you really sure that you're seeing and describing a real object, and not just an artifact? Something produced by your Martian techniques. So, even describing something unfamiliar, like a house, might be much more difficult than the Martian anticipated. Well, when it comes to living cells, when we try and interpret the images we get down microscopes, we've got a similar set of problems. And the history of the Golgi makes that only too clear. Camillo Golgi was born in 1843 in Corteno, near the historic city of Pavia, where he studied medicine and where he spent virtually the whole of his working life. Golgi was interested in uncovering the structure of the nervous system. And to this end, he invented a new staining technique. Hardening tissue with bichromate and staining with silver nitrate. And this allowed him to pick up individual nerve cells and the many fine connections between cells to be found in nerve networks. But in 1898, perhaps seeking the font of all wisdom, Golgi applied his technique to the brain of an owl. What he in fact found within the Purkinje cells of the brain, seen here, was a fine network, his apparato reticulare, reticular apparatus. Well, this wasn't confined to the brain of an owl. For example, in these cells, seen here, similar structures existed. But were they real? Sure enough, you could find such things in other cells, not just nerve cells. But they didn't always look the same. So were they really always the same thing? And not everyone could find such structures at all. It all seemed to depend very much on the staining technique. So inevitably, the question arose, did the reticular apparatus exist, or was it an artifact of staining techniques? Well, Golgi's fame was already well assured by his elegant work on the nervous system, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1906. So famous that when he died, they renamed his birthplace Corteno Golgi. But ironically, the thing with which we most directly associate his name today, his reticular apparatus, what we now call the Golgi apparatus, or quite simply the Golgi, remained controversial well beyond his death in 1926. We spoke to Cambridge biochemist, Professor Donald Northcott. When I started, it was about 1950. And at that time, the only thing you could really use was the optical microscope. And the optical microscope was being used, and the, there was very little uh, actual observation of organelles and what was inside the cell. So that the things you saw were specks, really. And these were labeled Golgi apparatus on the understanding of Golgi's work in which he'd stained with silver. But they're at the limits of optical microscopy, about one mu. And so that the idea of an organelle was in great doubt, an actual thing in the cell which had a definite function and which had a definite uh, shape and uh, uh, structure. And this was true of any organelle in the cell except the nucleus, really. The problem with the optical microscope is you're on the limits of resolution. One way of improving this is to shorten the wavelength of the light. In fact, go from visible light to a beam of electrons. This was possible using the electron microscope. This is a modern electron microscope being loaded with a specimen. The specimen, this time on a metal grid, is placed in a holder which is inserted into the electron microscope. The air is then evacuated by pumping it out, allowing electrons to travel through the vacuum.
The beam of electrons hitting the specimen produces an image which can be translated into our visible range as seen here on this monitor. This is a modern microscope, but were things always that easy? One of the first microscopes in England was a Siemens microscope taken from Germany at the end of the war from laboratories in Hamburg, shipped to, I think, Portsmouth or one port, and then since it, the Admiralty couldn't use it, they shipped it to a university, my university, Cambridge, where it was in fact assembled by the Cavendish laboratories, and then it was capable of being used. The difficulties with the microscope were immense. The power unit was put as a big bathtub on the top of the microscope. The thing took about uh, two hours to pump down. You only took one plate at a time, so you had to be really certain that the picture you were looking at was worth taking. You took the plate picture, and then you took the plate out, and then you put a new plate in, and then you had to pump down for two or three hours to get the vacuum before you could start again. So it was a lengthy process. Now, of course, you take 24 plates, that you put them in, you reel them off, 24 plates, you just put another cassette in, and it takes about 10 minutes or 5 minutes in a good microscope to pump it down again, and you're away. So it's very different. But before you could even use the microscope, as with today's microscope, you needed a decent specimen. In the 50s, the only way you could look at an object in the electron microscope was a solid object, which you shadowed with platinum and you put it on a, a grid, and you looked at it, and all you saw was the surface view. What people wanted were thin sections, as they did with optical microscopy. And that had to depend, really, upon the embedding techniques and the fixation techniques. The real breakthrough came with the embedding techniques. Before, we used to try and cut sections with paraffin, or as, as in optical microscopy. And the idea was that you would use swift blades you cut very, very fast, so we set up uh, razor blades on a revolving wheel and spun it at very high speeds to cut these paraffin sections. It was said that if you cut very fast, you get very thin sections. You see, the idea was to get thin sections because the electrons won't penetrate through a solid object. In the end, somebody thought of the idea of putting it into uh, araldite uh, and then polymerizing the araldite, and then you had a hard, solid object and then how did you cut it? You cut it with glass knives. You threw a bit of glass on the floor, picked out an edge which was in fact uh, sharp, set it up in a microtome and cut the section. The specimen is placed in a holder and screwed in position, ready for cutting on the microtome. But before this, the araldite is trimmed away with a razor blade. Nowadays, you don't have to throw glass on the floor to get a sharp edge. You can accurately produce glass knives or use a diamond edge as seen here. In front of the diamond edge is a trough which is filled with water ready to receive the very fine sections possible with this precise microtome. The fine sections are picked off onto tiny grids made of copper and palladium, the electron microscope equivalent of the light microscope glass slide. The specimens on the grids are now ready for staining. In this case, the stains have to absorb not visible light, like hematoxylin and eosin, but electrons. A common procedure is to use heavy metal salts. The specimens are placed in an automatic staining machine where they will be successively stained with lead and uranium at a controlled temperature and for a set time. The specimens are now ready for examination. The grids are put into the specimen holder 
and held in place and fed into the microscope. With electron microscopy, it was possible to get clear pictures of the Golgi. Did this immediately settle the matter? There are two uh, difficulties with the electron microscope. The actual uh, formation of artifacts and the interpretation of the image. If I take them in order, the artifacts first of all. The artifacts are obviously you get material, you fix it, you dehydrate it, you embed it, and then you cut it. All sorts of things can happen to the cell, especially during the fixation and dehydration. So it's essential, really, to approach the object from two or three different methods in order to interpret your final image to make sure you're not looking at an artifact. But artifacts are not peculiar to the electron microscope. I mean, artifacts are uh, brought about in any scientific work. You prod something, you alter it. So that it's not, it's, although it's emphasized a lot in electron microscopy, it's not really peculiar to electron microscopy. Nevertheless, you have to be careful by approaching the thing from several different points of view. Now the interpretation of the image. The image interpretation, you are interpreting a two-dimensional, essentially a two-dimensional image, you have to interpret in three dimensions. You can cut sections at different angles, which will give you the thing cut in perpendicular or horizontal, and then it needs imagination to fit these images together to give you the total three-dimensional object which you are actually looking at. And this is the sort of 3D image we now have of the Golgi. Thanks in large part to the beautiful work using the electron microscope, nowadays no one is in any doubt that the Golgi does indeed exist. And not only do we know that it exists in virtually all eukaryote cells, but we also know that it's a very interesting and important organelle. It seems that the Golgi is involved in putting the final touches to newly synthesized proteins. In the Golgi, carbohydrate side chains are added to the polypeptide chains. And it seems that this helps address the proteins ready for dispatch round the cell to their final destinations. Or in some cases, for export to the world outside the cell. But that raises a quite separate question. How do we know what the Golgi does? For that matter, how do we know what any organelle, any cellular structure does? After all, the Martian might build up a detailed description of a house, but would that description in itself tell the Martian that the structure was a building, let alone one where people lived? Well, that's the Martian's problem. Our problem is to attach function to cellular structure. We start the morning now here at the Open University with a biological brain feeder. Yeah. And the final zone this morning on BBC Two is the Open University. There's a glimpse into the working of plant cells. That's followed by an inspection of the Palace of Fontainebleau and a trip round Florence to find medieval life amidst the bustle of a modern city. Our first Open University programme this morning blends biology, chemistry and history and looks at plant cells. Thank you. 
It's like a city with its variety of structures, each with a defined function. The eukaryotic cell is a complex collection of different organelles, a microscopic metropolis in which each organelle is a separate entity carrying out one or other cellular function. Information coding and transfer, energy production, synthesis or breakdown of macromolecules. But hang on, that can't be the whole story. The cell has to function as a whole. So how separate, how autonomous can organelles really be? Surely they must interact to some extent. There must be some overall integration. Well, to investigate this, we're going to concentrate on just one organelle, the chloroplast. That's the organelle characteristic of plant cells. Perhaps the major evolutionary triumph of green plants is their ability to harness the energy of sunlight during photosynthesis. It's in the chloroplast that the cellular machinery for photosynthesis is located. The organelle, one of a group called plastids, is a complex one. It has an envelope with two membranes, an outer and an inner one. These surround a soluble fraction, or stroma, that contains the enzymes for carbon dioxide fixation. Within the stroma is a system of membrane sacs called thylakoids, which contain chlorophyll. These are organized into stacks called grana, where light is trapped and the energy used to make ATP. Besides these reactions of photosynthesis, the chloroplast also contains other metabolic pathways. For instance, pathways for the synthesis of amino acids and fatty acids, and others for the synthesis of photosynthetic pigments, such as carotenoids and chlorophylls. It almost seems as if the chloroplast is as complex as a complete cell. And indeed, it also contains DNA, and the enzymes for transcribing DNA to give messenger RNA and ribosomes and other factors for translating messenger RNA to produce proteins. In other words, the chloroplast contains a complete protein synthesizing system, a complete genetic system. So what's the precise role of this genetic system? A question that's fascinated John Ellis and his colleagues at Warwick University for many years. Peas are their plants of choice because they're easy to grow and are a convenient source of chloroplasts. But building up a detailed picture of any organelle often calls for some judicious breaking down of the cell, for cell fractionation. It's clear from the microscopic studies that have been carried out on cells over many decades that cells are very complicated structures. They have lots of internal bits and pieces. And these have been well described by microscopists. But uh, sadly, you can't tell very much from a picture about what these structures actually do. So the purpose of cell fractionation is to actually break the cell open and isolate all the bits and pieces, find out what they're made of, and find out what they do. In many ways, the art of biochemistry is the art of controlled violence, because what we're trying to do is to break, and break the cell open to release the various bits and pieces, but not be so violent that you destroy the properties of those pieces. So essentially we aim to try and get out chloroplasts which are intact because that approximates uh, more to the uh, normal in vivo situation. A crude chloroplast suspension can be obtained from the leaf homogenate by centrifugation. With practice, it's possible to obtain suspensions for experiments in less than five minutes a crucial factor when trying to isolate metabolically active organelles. After centrifugation, the top layer contains the soluble components of the cell which can be discarded. The remaining dark green residue is a mixture of intact and broken chloroplasts. So much for isolating the organelle. What about its structure? 
One approach is to examine its component proteins. A useful method for this is known as SDS gel electrophoresis. Samples of chloroplasts are loaded onto a gel containing the detergent sodium dodecyl sulfate or SDS. This separates the proteins in the samples into their component polypeptide chains. Expose the samples to an electric current and the protein molecules migrate down the gel at a speed determined by their size. A variety of chloroplast preparations can be studied in this way. The thylakoids, the stroma or the whole organelles. After staining the gel with a blue dye, the proteins show up as individual bands along each sample track. In an SDS gel, the proteins are separated according to molecular mass, with those of high molecular mass migrating more slowly than those of low molecular mass. Remember there are three sets of tracks, one for whole chloroplasts, the stroma and the thylakoids. There are many proteins distributed between the chloroplast fractions but the dominant bands turn out to be components of a single protein in the stroma, Rubisco. One, with a molecular mass of about 55,000, is called the large subunit. The other, with a molecular mass of 14,000, is called the small subunit. The Rubisco molecule, in fact, contains eight copies of each type of subunit. Rubisco stands for ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. It catalyzes an important reaction in the stroma of chloroplasts. The addition of carbon dioxide to the 5-carbon sugar, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, to form two molecules of a 3-carbon sugar, 3-phosphoglycerate. This is the first step in the photosynthetic cycle that fixes carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. Rubisco is the most abundant protein in chloroplasts, making up about 50% of their total protein. Now abundance works in your favour if you're a biochemist. It means that the protein is easy to detect in extracts, it means it's very easy to uh, characterise and purify uh, but more importantly, it means that the genetic system of the plant must devote, must devote a large part of its effort to making this particular protein. So the gene for this protein is active and uh, the messenger RNA for this protein is active. OK, so Rubisco is the major chloroplast protein. Now remember that chloroplasts contain DNA, ribosomes and all the various enzymes needed to synthesize RNA and proteins. So it's pretty obvious that the major chloroplast protein, Rubisco, must be synthesized in the chloroplast. The best way to study this is to look at protein synthesis within the chloroplasts themselves. First, any intact chloroplasts must be separated from those with broken envelope membranes so that the ribosomes in the stroma can be retained. This can be done by layering the crude chloroplast suspension onto a gradient which will separate the different components according to their buoyant densities. After centrifugation, the chloroplast mixture becomes resolved into a series of bands. The lowest layer contains broken chloroplasts, while the central layer contains the intact organelles. Do these actually synthesize their own proteins? We can follow this by adding a labeled amino acid, such as methionine, to see if it gets incorporated into newly synthesized protein. In an illuminated water bath, the intact chloroplasts use light energy to generate their own ATP which then drives protein synthesis. Remember the total array of chloroplast proteins revealed by the SDS gels. Which of these contain radioactive label and so were actually synthesized during the experiment? To find out, 
some radiation sensitive film can be placed over the dried gel. Any radioactivity in the sample will affect silver ions in the film emulsion. Developing the film gives an autoradiograph whose pattern of darkened silver grains will reveal the distribution of label within the sample. Remember the SDS gels which showed the proteins present in whole chloroplasts, the stroma and the thylakoids. Here are the large and small subunits of Rubisco. Now here's the autoradiograph showing which proteins were actually being synthesized by the chloroplasts. In the stroma, the main product is the large subunit of Rubisco. But there's no trace of the small subunit being synthesized by the chloroplasts. So where is it actually made? One way to find out is to examine the effect of antibiotics on protein synthesis in intact shoots. One is placed into a control tube containing labelled amino acids. A second is placed in a tube which also contains chloramphenicol. This inhibits protein synthesis on chloroplast ribosomes, but not on ribosomes in the cytosol. A third sample is placed in cyclohexamide, which has the reverse effect. It inhibits protein synthesis on cytosolic, but not chloroplast ribosomes. The advantages of using inhibitors for studying what proteins are made by chloroplasts is that you can address this question without disrupting the cell and providing you have a suitable way of monitoring the synthesis of the chloroplast proteins, you can then use these inhibitors to determine which part of the cell is actually making a particular protein. So what are the effects of the antibiotics on the young plant cells? Remember that chloramphenicol inhibits protein synthesis on chloroplast ribosomes. We can use it to follow the synthesis of the large and small subunits of Rubisco. Results show that the synthesis of the large subunit is inhibited, but not the small subunit. The situation is different with cyclohexamide, which inhibits protein synthesis on cytosolic ribosomes. This time, synthesis of the small subunit is inhibited, but not the large subunit. So these studies suggest that the large subunit is synthesized in the chloroplast, while the small subunit is made in the cytosol. So it turns out Rubisco isn't entirely made in the chloroplast. Large subunit is made there, but small subunit isn't. In fact, small subunit is synthesized in the cytosol on cytosolic ribosomes. Now that must mean to get entire mature rubisco in the chloroplast, the small subunit must be transferred from the cytosol into the chloroplast. But how? The small subunit is made in the cytosol in the form of a precursor. That is, it's slightly larger in size than the mature small subunit that you isolate from the mature rubisco. The reason it is larger in size is because it has an extra set of amino acids at one end. And this set of amino acids acts essentially as an address. It tells the precursor to go to the chloroplast, and when it's at the chloroplast, it allows the chloroplast to take it up. Once it's inside, the uh, extra piece is removed, thus generating the mature small subunit inside the chloroplast, where it then assembles with the large subunit to make the complete rubisco. But assembly of the subunits within the chloroplast to give the mature enzyme isn't straightforward. We observed in our early work on the synthesis of the large subunit of Rubisco by isolated chloroplasts that the large subunit when it's made does not enter the uh, intercombination with the small subunit immediately, instead it combines with another protein. And the purpose of this protein, we think, is to ensure that the large subunit interacts in a correct fashion with the small subunit. If this protein isn't present, then what happens is that the large subunit interacts with itself incorrectly to produce a useless product. And so for this reason, we've termed this other protein a chaperone. It's rather like the human chaperone. The function of the human chaperone is to make sure that a pair of people interact together in, in a proper fashion. 
But once that job is done, then of course the chaperone goes away. The chaperone isn't present on the wedding night, for example. And therefore this seems an appropriate name to describe the function of this type of protein. So we've seen that in a leaf cell, the components of Rubisco are coded for at two distinct sites. The DNA of the chloroplast specifies the information for the large subunit, which is synthesized on chloroplast ribosomes. However, the DNA coding for the small subunit is located in the nucleus, and this subunit is synthesized on cytosolic ribosomes. The small subunit contains an address label that allows it to be transported into the chloroplast. Once inside, the address label is removed. A special protein, called a chaperone, is also synthesized in the cytosol. It too contains an address label that enables it to enter the chloroplast. By binding to the large subunit, the chaperone assists in the assembly of the small and large subunits into the whole enzyme. So a chloroplast does have a degree of autonomy. But despite its own genetic system, it can't even make all its own proteins. And we could have told a similar story for the mitochondrion. That's also got a complete genetic system, but like the chloroplast, it too can't make all its own proteins. So why are things organized this way? Why this partial autonomy? Well, we could ask a similar question about some cities. In many ways, this is a typical village. A church, a green, a high street with a few shops, and of course, a pub or two. A little self-contained community out in the countryside. Well, in fact, it's not in the countryside. It is a village, Highgate Village, but it's right in the heart of London. If you didn't know London, you might think that it was deliberately organised this way. A cluster of semi-autonomous villages, each with their own shops serving the needs of the local people. But the main reason is actually historical. About 200 years ago, Highgate was a village several miles outside London. but the city gradually swallowed it up so that now it's part of the busy metropolis. Now back to cells and organelles. When we see the apparent semi-autonomy of chloroplasts and mitochondria, should we be looking for some functional reason for this way of organization? Perhaps some subtle economy to the cell as a whole? Or, as for Highgate, should we look more towards history, towards an evolutionary explanation? From our present knowledge, it doesn't make a lot of economic sense to have genes outside the nucleus. It would seem a lot simpler to have all the genes inside the nucleus. And so, as with many things in biology, we have to turn to the history of the system. And the current belief is that this situation has arisen because the eukaryotic cell, the eukaryotic cell itself, is really a mixture of several types of cells, including prokaryotic cells, bacterial cells. In other words, if you go back in evolution far enough, you would find a situation where there were eukaryotic cells, but they didn't have any mitochondria or plastids. These arose subsequently by the uh, development from ingested symbiotic bacteria. According to the hypothesis, free-living photosynthetic bacteria which probably resembled our modern-day cyanobacteria, were actually taken up by primitive nucleated cells over a billion years ago. The bacteria retained their ability to photosynthesize and to replicate throughout successive generations of the host cell. But eventually they lost their capacity for independent survival and became an integral part of the host. This probably involved a transfer of some genes from the ingested cell to the host nucleus. This process of endosymbiosis could represent the first step in the evolution of organelles such as the chloroplast. <laughs> 
Similar arguments are used to explain the origin of mitochondria. So that's the story. But what evidence is there that chloroplasts might have had a bacterial origin? Let's start with the molecular evidence. The circular DNA of the chloroplast is very similar in sequence and arrangement to bacterial DNA and quite different from that in the nucleus. Chloroplast ribosomes are also closely related to bacterial ribosomes. They're even sensitive to antibiotics like chloramphenicol, which are well-known inhibitors of protein synthesis in bacteria. But we don't even have to probe as deeply as that. This flatworm is green because it harbors photosynthetic algae in its tissues. The intimate association between two organisms, symbiosis, is widespread in nature. In fact, many single-celled organisms are found as symbionts in a variety of invertebrates. What's more, endosymbiosis, one cell living inside another, also occurs. But we're interested in what might be the next evolutionary step from this. Here's the unicellular organism, Cyanophora paradoxa. It contains structures called cyanelles, whose cell walls and photosynthetic membranes are remarkably like those of cyanobacteria. But unlike free-living cyanobacteria, these cyanelles don't have enough DNA to code for all their proteins. In fact, they only contain about as much DNA as a chloroplast. And yet, unlike modern-day chloroplasts, the cyanelles do have genes coding for both the large and small subunits of Rubisco. So it's tantalizing to speculate that these structures might simulate an intermediate stage in the evolution of chloroplasts. Our study of the chloroplast has covered a lot of ground. At the practical level, we've seen the importance of both cell fractionation and the use of inhibitors in dissecting a cell. In other words, finding out where things happen. And at the biological level too, there's been a very important message. Often, when we're looking for explanation in biology, we have to resort to history, to the evolutionary history of the system. <laughs> Thank you.